All right, folks, we are uh, at the last keynote of EuroPython 2021. And it's uh, with great pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce Joanna. Uh, Joanna is a, a very well-known member of our, uh, our community. She was uh, originally uh, born in uh, Uganda, uh, Africa, and uh, uh, she now, be uh, I believe, lives in uh, Canada. She uh, is a Python core developer. She is a, a published author and a uh, director of the Python Software Foundation. She is going to uh, tell us about uh, Python, the bad parts. So I would really like to welcome uh, Joanna here. Uh, thank you so much, Joanna, for taking the time to prepare your talk and uh, to uh, be here with us. And uh, um, I leave you the stage. I'll uh, add your slides. Uh, this is a 45 minute talk and uh, we are all very excited about it and uh, uh, wish you best of luck in delivering it. Uh, take it away, Joanna. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, as you've already, uh, they've already told you, my name is Joanna and today I'm going to to give a talk about Python uh, titled Python the Bad Parts. Uh, I'll start with a bit of uh, stuff that is already been said because I'd already planned for it. So I'm originally from Africa in a country called Uganda uh, and in a city called Kampala. So I had to put Africa because most people think Africa is a country. Africa is not a country. Uganda is a country. And uh, I left Uganda two years ago to to come to New Brunswick in Canada, where I'm currently staying and do my PhD uh, in collaboration with IBM and the University of New Brunswick. I'm a, uh, in, term, in terms of other things, I'm a Python core developer. I've been for around 1.9 years, 1.9, one more month until I become two years as the C Python core developer. I'm a director of the PSF, and uh, I will be talking about uh, a little bit about my work and my plans uh, for the Python community. But I would like to first take the time to thank every, everyone that entrusted me with their vote to be a director of the PSF. I do not take it lightly, so I really appreciate uh, the trust you put in me to be a director for this year. And I'm excited for all the many things that we are going to do during my term as a, as a PSF director. In my other life, I hinted that I do, uh, I, I'm doing a PhD, so I do, uh, my research is on, on garbage collection in Python. And uh, I look at both the garbage collection in general for the uh, for the reference implementation that is C Python, but also alternate implementations uh, like PyPy. Uh, I am funded by IBM under the Center for Advanced Studies, so and uh, at the University of New Brunswick. I authored Python two and three compatibility uh, sometime sometime uh, some years ago. Probably when the subject was very hot. I don't know if the subject is still hot right now, but uh, you can check out uh, the book if you want. I'd love to first start by saying I'm really honored to be here. And I would love to thank uh, the organizers of EuroPython. Uh, this is my first time to attend a Europe Best Python conference or even speak at one for that matter. I've spoken at a Ruby conference that, that's called Euroco, like so many years ago, but I'd never spoken to any uh, at any conference in Europe and Python per se. So uh, I'm really honored uh, to, to be a speaker or on the speaker lineup for this year. And I don't take it for granted. So let's start with uh, why are we actually here? Uh, why do we attend conferences? Uh, specifically, why do we come for PyCon? I, st I, I started to attend PyCon in 2016. Uh, it, and my first PyCon was in 
South Africa. It's called uh, Pycon. Yeah, it's Pycon South Africa, and it 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 was held in uh, in Cape Town, and that was my first encounter at a Pycon. And I had I didn't know why I was going for a Pycon anyway. So anyway, I reached there, and I, I I talked to so many people and I asked them, why do you come for PyCon? Uh, why do you come for PyCon? Why do you even attend conferences in the first place? And uh, the group of people that were there, of course, they were Python users. It was a whole Python community. They are not just commu they just they're not united by the fact that they use Python. They are also friends in general. And so my conclusion after my very first PyCon uh, in Cape Town in South Africa was that. I think we all come to PyCons or we attend PyCons to celebrate the awesomeness of Python. Uh, Python as a language in different ways. Um, some, uh, sometimes we come uh, as a trip. Uh, it could be a vacation, but if we end up in a Python convention, in a PyCon hall, we are usually there to celebrate how awesome Python is and uh, the great things uh, Python as a language has, or as a community, or as an ecosystem, has accorded us uh, the different things we are able to do with the language. So we celebrate Python's awesomeness first as a language. Uh, I started to use Python in 2013, and uh, actually 2010, 2010, I, when I was an undergrad student. And then I had different reasons for using Python, but uh, the, the first reason was initially I was just forced to use the language. It was taught in class, so I was given assignments in Python. It was not fun then because the whole class failed. The professor taught it very hard, so the whole class failed. Uh, failed that the assignments. However, that I, I after failing like two assignments in the class, towards our final exam, I read the whole book, Python book, uh, from cover to cover, and then I was able to pass the final exam. That's a story of another day. But uh, I've, I just uh, fell in love with the syntax, the simplicity uh, of the language. And I do not share this, uh, this belief or notion alone. So many people have talked about how Python is awesome as a language, uh, how it can it's used everywhere, how it's beginner friendly. I think I can I initially I identified with the second reason. The first reason as I became an expert, yeah, I started to appreciate why people say that. And but also the community and then Python as a language has helped us. Uh, personally, I can speak for myself, but also many people. In the audience, it has helped you find a job just because you know a skill and you're able to pay your bills or uh, in your family because you know Python or because, because you're using Python as a tool uh, for your career or for your employment. Python as a community is also awesome uh, as, many as many people have said. And most popularly, Brett Cannon said, he came, he came, he, he came to learn, he came, to learn Python the language, or he was interested in Python the language, but he ended up staying because of the community. And so many of us can attest to that. Personally, I also started getting very, I started as a user, I wasn't very interested. And I started, uh, I, I started getting uh, so much into the language because I had some sort of research. However, I stayed because people in the community were interested in what I could, in my contribution to the community, but also the language uh, as a whole. Uh, personally, I was mentored by Victor Stina uh, to be a Python code developer, and uh, he helped, his mentorship did not only help me to be an expert uh, as a Python core developer, but it also helped me to be in my professional life uh, in general. And they have made so many friends, not just on a technical level, but in general, just genuine friends uh, in the community. So the Python community, aside from the language or the technicalities of the things we talk about, uh, the Python community is awesome uh, as well. The, Python as an ecosystem is also awesome, and I and probably you can attest to it because we are able to use Python the language mostly because of its ecosystem. 
its ecosystem in terms of the different libraries. Uh, Python is a very popular language right now with uh, so many libraries literally uh, simplifying our work in, uh, in industry or academia or anything we're doing. A vast majority of uh, Python uh, libraries for in scientific uh, programming, a uh, vast majority of things like uh, alternate implementations like PyPy, uh, PyStorm and uh, so many other things, libraries for the most famous or the niche or cutting edge technologies like machine learning and deep learning. So the Python ecosystem has uh, empowered us, its users, uh, uh, with great great tools that are simplifying our lives uh, in our work and uh, on our projects and in uh, our businesses. And so, again, at PyCon and in our daily lives as Python users, we also celebrate the ecosystem because of how uh, awesome it is and how rich it is and how uh, big it is and how useful, uh, for example, it is. However, today, I would love. Uh, I, I want to. I want us to take a step uh, back, or I want us to talk about a different view of Python. Uh, I've talked about its awesomeness and how uh, it's been a great language, and we cannot say there is no argument about that. Like Python is already good, even as it is now. It's a. It's a good language, but I want to talk about some of the things. Uh, we could improve as, as most especially as a language but also as a community in general so my original title was python the bad parts and then i thought about it uh well i had i had already submitted that the title so i wouldn't change it but then i was making my talk i i said maybe this title is actually going to trigger some people uh mostly maybe python core developers or as, uh, because my talk is mostly about the language itself so i said okay i'm going to probably change it uh a little bit so instead of us instead of you or, or of us looking at my talk or whatever i'm going to talk about as really criticizing python or uh airing uh python's dirty laundry maybe we could change this title and start to look at it like, instead, a reflection on Python's potential. Uh, like Python is already doing interesting stuff, but today I want you to join me in us reflecting on what Python can be uh, in, this, in, in, this, in this time and age. Python is about 30 years old, and I'm sure uh, probably Guido, uh, Guido Van Rossum probably started working on Python before I was born. So again, I may not be the right person to be criticizing it, and I'm sure Guido Van Rossum had the best ideas for the language because as time went on, we were using it because he made very many good decisions then. However, 30 years, uh, uh, 30 years have gone since then, and right now, I think it's also a good time to start talking about what Python can be and uh, what what new things, uh, what 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 new things or what path Python could be taking right now. It's not necessarily criticism. I think it's good love because I'm a, an avid Python user and I believe all of you are. So the intention of this talk is not to talk down on the people that put a lot of effort in the language. It's to look, to have just a quick reflection of what could it be? What more could Python the language be? I'll start by a brief discussion on what successful languages are. There, uh, Best of a paper that was written a couple of years ago by these two authors, Leo and Ario, they did an empirical analysis of programming languages and they they gave us some insight and they said uh, successful programming languages are not successful because of new features or the complex features that are always released every day. Surprise, uh, it's instead there are like three key uh, ideas of or things that make a language successful. One is uh, accessible libraries. And Python is a successful language. It's a popular uh, language because one is 
It also has accessible libraries, uh, PyPI, uh, uh, the Python uh, index where all our, the Python cheese shop where all our libraries are. It's a very rich set and collection of Python libraries that the de developers of Python have always have, uh, have used and continue using. Languages are successful because there is proof of usage according to the authors of this paper. Uh, there is no denying that Python is successful. Again, it meets this goal because Py the Py there is Python code running everywhere. There is Python code now running on Mars. NASA is using a Python code. There's Python code in machine learning. Python code is being used in all walks of life for web and uh, uh, scientific programming, things of all kinds. So there is proof of usage. So again, by this definition, Python is already a very successful language. It also, there is experience. Sorry. Sorry for that. So uh, successful languages are also uh, successful because of the experience they give to their programmers. Again, Python has been hailed for its simplicity in terms of syntax because it's allowed beginners to easily experiment, but also rapidly prototype ideas uh, it, and bring up idea, uh, solutions in a very short amount of time. So by this definition, Python is popular and very successful. So we cannot argue with that. However, success the success we've attained or the success that Python has can only be sustained by relevance. So like I said, the, 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 the problems we're solving 30 years ago are probably not the same problems we are solving now. So as a language and basic mainly maybe as a core team of the Python language or as its users, because Python is open source, so everyone has a responsibility to probably make it better. We need to be looking at how relevant the language remains as time goes by and as uh, as as things change, as different hardware changes, as technology changes, as our needs evolve, the success of Python is only going to be sustained by how it grows to be relevant uh, with the times, uh, 40 years from now, uh, we should not probably be having the same version of Python. And I have, uh, I have hope that we are always evolving. But today I want to talk about a few challenges that Python is facing. And uh, I want to talk about all of them because <laughs> uh if if i if i if i asked uh if i wrote out a thread on twitter and asked people why do you hate python there'll probably be a million reasons why people hate python however today i would just talk about five about five things that i find that where python could be improving and informed by my own understanding and some discussions uh that have been on different mailing lists i don't promise to give an idea of every problem and i don't think these are the only priority problems right now uh, also i have to preface is that it's in my view i'll have to start with performance now python is not c so we are not expecting uh, c level uh, performance in python however being a dynamic language and an interpreter it has also its limitations but i believe there is still room to improve the performance uh, of Python. Uh, we are in, Python is in a paradigm with, that it shares a paradigm with other languages. And I believe uh, uh, we can borrow from a lot of research that has been written specific to dynamic languages and find a way of uh, improving the performance uh, the performance, uh, our perfor the performance that Python uh, is able to give its users right now. Uh, there is work in the community, and I would like to shout out to to the Microsoft, the core developers that work at Microsoft. They've been spearheading a lot of efforts in uh, in ensuring that uh, we have a faster. We have a faster Python interpreter, especially the, uh, the C Python, the reference implementation, and. Uh, because of some of the challenges 
we also saw alternate some alternate implementations have been motivated by i mean the not so good performance of python to 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 come up uh, with things like uh, jitting, uh, for example, with other concepts like jitting and better probably garbage collection, they've been motivated by this same aspect of uh, performance. So if we are to be relevant and uh, as a language and spearhead and and spearhead or be move with the times, we have to be. I think right now is a very important time to be looking at uh, where the Python uh, interpreter could be improved. Again, I know there is, uh, of course, a lot of work happening on even on the reference implementation and uh, the and alternate implementations. I think this is priority. Uh, I think it should be some. There should be some sort of priority given to performance right now. I mean, we could be better i'm not saying we can be like c we could be better uh so that we do not lose some of our users uh, obviously again python was not built to be a language for everything but we can do something about it the other challenge that has been talked about has been the standard library so my first uh, language summit uh, was in 2019 when I came to PyCon US and uh, one of the heated discussions we're having was the standard library. And uh, so very many talks and discussions happen around the standard library on very many mailing lists. And usually most people are talking about, okay, let's we have to trim the standard library and make sure we just remain with what we need. But I think, yes, I think that's valid. I mean, there is an aspect that we're still having very old things in the standard library and things that are not uh, useful right now. However, most of the problem of, in the standard library is because we are not, what should I say, improving or maintaining the batteries we have in there. I mean, we can trim it as much as we want, but we will, we will, I think we need to, even whatever we remain with, in the standard library, we need to find a way of making sure we improve the modules that we still keep there because we are not solving any problems. So what happens again, two years, 10 years from now, will we still just keep trimming off uh, things from the standard library uh, all the time? I think we should just have a pathway towards uh, instead improving some of those, the libraries we feel are important. I'm not against trimming it, uh, the, it it further, but I think we should be also make sure we handle the an underlying problem, which is there unmaintained uh, in some sort of way. Uh, the other aspect is garbage collection. Now, garbage collection as a topic or as a paradigm has lasted for 60 years now. And uh, it's an, it, it has aged as it's as old as six years right now, 60 years. Python is about 30 years. However, I, and without downgrading anybody, and I know most people know about the challenge, I think we should be looking at, at moving probably to tracing garbage collection and generational garbage collection because the industry has moved. A lot of research has shown. Yep, so Python is based on reference counting. We could call it a hybrid because uh, reference counting does not collect cycles. So there is a sort of... Uh, a tracing like uh, GC that handles uh, cycles. So GC research, research has showed us that uh, tracing garbage collection does well uh, in terms of uh, performance and uh, we can uh, improve it. We can further even optimize it where, with uh, parallelism and so, so many other things. So if we are to be relevant and uh, go with the time, I think we should be looking at uh, improving some garbage collection for the for cpython the reference implementation at some point and then this is that something that has been discussed for long it's posed so many um there are so many questions to answer in in terms of supporting this but i think this is a good time to start thinking uh, about uh, garbage collection because again if we are to be relevant I mean, maybe we should be thinking about moving to tracing garbage collection, maybe generational, because it, as it stands, it looks like we are almost 20 years behind uh, 
behind the landscape or behind innovation or behind research. And I accept the challenges we are still facing. And I think, but I still think we can do, uh, we can do more uh, in this area. The other interesting aspects that I also touch on in my research, but also in general has been the CAPI. Um, so we've we, we've hailed alternate implementations that have come up. First of all, they've been motivated by performance of the reference implementation. However, they've all been blocked by the aspect that they cannot efficiently uh, support uh, the uh, Python extension modules. So the CAPI was built to be very simple. And if we looked at the if we look at the implementation of the CAPI and you compare it to the design at that time that python was built they made some they could they made some good decisions at the time but now i don't think uh, some of the design decisions in the cfpi uh, uh as we've seen uh it's evolved to be unmaintainable but uh alternate implementations cannot efficiently uh support it i think it's only pipi that has tried to maybe successfully uh support the cfpi but as as if you uh but the way they support it has also come with the uh, performance some performance degradation and if you go to the pipi uh, documentation you can read about all the challenges they are facing uh by virtue of how the cpi was designed and could two key things come into mind it's just that it exposes too many things but it's it, it's also tied so many uh, things like in VM in, uh, implementation details, like garbage collections and exposing it. So it's been a block at so many alternate implementations uh, to successfully uh, uh, support it. I've, re I've been reading a couple of papers and from the time I think Lua was, uh, was implemented, they've been using the, the Python CAPI as an example of how not to implement a CAPI. So many people have learned from us how, in terms of how not to implement a CAPI according to those papers, which is unfortunate. And I'm not criticizing anybody, but I think this is something we can also, I think right now, start looking at it and uh, try to see if we can find a solution. So uh, that's those are my key things about the language in general, but uh, I would also love to talk about some, maybe one thing about uh, the Python ecosystem that some people have probably been grumbling about. And uh, uh, it's core development. Uh, in general, in and when I talk about code development, I'm talking about how how the language is managed or maintained uh, in general uh, in terms of uh, bugs, receiving bugs, how bugs are triaged, how development is managed, the response to pull requests, and, uh, uh, and generally the response to contributions. Uh, first of all, by the core team, but also from contributors in general. So when you look at core mentorship, recently, uh, so so many core developers have tried to, uh, because the core team, uh, it's not as big, uh, but also the active core developers are not as many. So uh, it's too much work for very few people. And I know that there is a lot of effort by core developers like Victor Stina, even Guido Van Rossum and other, and other people that have been mentoring very many new members to join the core team. And, but there is still friction around, right now we're having like 1,400 uh, pull requests that, uh, that, that are still open on the uh, CPython project. And most of them are actually never reviewed. And this, this is an open problem. It still remains to be open. And I don't know how we will effectively uh, 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 solve it. However, right now, I think it's, it's very, in my view, from my two years uh, of joining core development, I'm seeing like so many people are grumbling about the whole how core development is uh, is managed. The idea that people are willing to submit PRs and people are not there to 
to to review them. And I'm not even blaming the court team because I mean, no one is paid besides people have families and stuff, and they do other things after work. And uh, besides, the court team is very small, so I'm not even blaming anybody. And then there are other factors. Uh, even if you had time as a core developer, you cannot review every pull request because we also every core developer we have varying uh, we have varying levels of expertise. So it's unrealistic to expect one person to be reviewing uh, everything. I think my point here is that uh, it's a very difficult topic, and but we need to be looking at it because uh, so many people are grumbling and uh, talking about it. So I think it's high time we started to talk about it because it, it will affect how people look at the language because if they think they're submitting bugs and no one even triages it or even looks at it or responds to it after 10 years, then it starts to be a problem. Probably people will look for other better places to be which is not a problem to any specific individual, but I guess it's something we need to talk about. So what is the way forward? I don't think I have any, I don't think I have solutions to all these problems. And I've just talked about just a few of them. And I don't promise that any, I don't even know if anybody has a single solution uh, for, for all those challenges. But I think the solution or the way forward is, is in some way among us. Uh, in some way, the solution to all the problems the Python as a language or ecosystem is facing, in some way, the solutions live in its community. We just need to uncover them in some sort of way. Uh, I don't know, EuroPython, I think, is having about 1,000 uh, uh, attendees. PyCon US usually has so many thousands of attendees as well and i think uh, as a collective unit we have a solution the solutions are somewhere in us we just need to find a way of tapping into them organizing ourselves towards uh, having some sort of solutions and if we think more about some of the problems we are having we could find a way for them i just have a few tips that i'm going to talk about today the challenges Python is facing as a language are not unique. Some uh, some some new languages, like I told you, especially Lua, because I've read so many papers that have been written, especially by the Lua core team. When they started to build Lua, they've uh, they first of all looked at Python and tried to avoid <laughs> its uh, problems. But also, we can learn something from them, especially in how they've. Uh, evolved and uh, changed specific aspects of especially Lua. And I'm not, I'm trying to say Python's problems are not very unique. For example, I've been following the story about Lua's CAPI and they've made drastic changes, even changes that we fear, we are fearing to make. Some of them that we are fearing to make right now as a uh, Python, but we could we could learn something from them, especially on how they evolved the CAPI. They made so many radical decisions in how Lua Lua CAPI changed. Maybe we could learn from them. And again, uh, take my advice with not so much salt. Because again, we need to look at other things. Like uh, there are some things we cannot totally compare. But I'm saying we can learn from some of these new languages, languages like V8 uh, and, and Rust. Uh, the, 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 the way uh, C8, the V8 uh, garbage collection especially works for both uh, the, the, the normal JavaScript, but also C extensions for garbage collection. Uh, they use handles, I think something that HPy does. Again, there are things we could borrow from some of these new languages. Uh, they've written a couple of papers where they're actually using Python as uh, an example, they're using Python's problems so that they don't design languages that look like, that have the same challenges like Python. So the first place we can look at uh, these languages and uh, we see what we can do uh, borrowing from some of the ideas. Now, I I talked about the CAPI, how it's problematic and problems like garbage collection and uh, 
maybe other performance related problems. It's not going to be easy to change the CAPI or to change to tracing garbage collection. And those ideas are very radical. But what we can do is if we can have researchers like me and other people, if you're probably doing your PhD or considering to do your PhD, and uh, you, could, you could start, you could decide to work on some, some of these problems. Because I think what we need is people simulating some of these radical ideas that are probably the core team is still afraid to try. And then from the insight that these researchers are simulating, we can find a way of to see if some of these ideas will actually flow well with the language. That's one thing we could try because, for example, for compatibility reasons, there is a big fear of totally changing the CAPI, even if we have the solutions. But if we have people simulating and creating insight, then probably we'll have some confidence in the core team trying to gradually bo borrow some of these ideas. And some that can be merged into core uh, the the core into on into the project as they are. I mean, it wouldn't be bad if they don't pose a uh, serious compatibility or serious problems. I think the idea is that we need to create insight. Uh, if you're a researcher, probably you should look at simulating some of these radical ideas. And I have already talked about. Uh, the, my whole issue about the standard library is that just streaming stuff is not going to improve unless we have a pathway to to saying that even the stuff we keep in 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 the standard library, if we commit that we shall improve, we commit we have a commitment to improving. It. Otherwise, we are not solving the problem. Uh, will we delete or trim the standard library until we only have if else uh, for only? I mean, it won't make sense at some point. I think as we trim, let's find a pathway towards it. And I think the question is, if you're trimming stuff and telling people to go to the, to go to PyPI, let's have a clear path of where these, these deleted uh, modules are going. I think that that's, that's going to put some confidence in people. Otherwise, if we just, delete stuff and we don't have a good way of what to, where to place those things that are we going to leave for users. Uh, that's my thing. Again, there are so many efforts around. Per, so when we talk about these problems, very many people are engineering solutions. Uh, however, I think this is a time to take caution because over engineering is not over engineering does not always come with performance or solve our benefits. Let's prioritize uh, guided engineering. And uh, so I think I've read uh, I've read uh, stories elsewhere in other language in a language I want I want to mention right now. So they over engineered something and 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 uh, removed it later. So over engineering is not uh, helping. I mean, I think the engineering should guide it, should be guided by the problems we are currently facing, uh, at least uh, priority wise. So if it's a, if it's something is a performance uh, related fix, let's I mean uh, let's weigh it and see if it's really giving us the benefits we're claiming it has. And if it's not, however, uh, even if it's running on top of cutting edge technology, I think we shouldn't be merging. So let's have a balance between not engineering for the sake of engineering. I think that applies to, to, to the core team. And uh, Python has done a lot of work in, uh, uh, right now uh, we have uh, a, a, a a developer in residence that just works on C Python, so that has been a good step. But I also encourage so many other companies to to probably think about uh, sponsoring and financing uh, a, a developer in residence roles, so that we have more people. Uh, this will uh, improve the language because if you're running on Python and we are not investing a lot in it, then we are probably building onto uh, crumbling infrastructure per se so like i said uh, i would love to before i end the talk i would have to say that uh the solution to all the our problems all the bad parts of python the solutions live among us and if we cooperate it doesn't care it doesn't matter because python is open source and 
any one of us, if if even if even if just two thousand of us uh, wanted to get a solution, we are enough to make uh, Python to improve or make Python better. I think I we just need to cooperate and uh, be willing to share all ideas. And if we have time, uh, put in the time. And for companies, if you have money, if you can't put in time, then you can put in money to support uh, all the programs that the PSF uh, has in ensuring that Python, the language is relevant uh, in terms of the, all the activities that surround the language and its ecosystem. And uh, um, if you want to talk about some of the things you can cooperate on as uh, part of my plan of, uh, for being a PSF director is I want to highlight some of the research we have in our community. And so if you are, if you if you do uh, research in Python, I would love to talk to you. I have a couple of plans I have for us. And uh, if you do Python in education, uh, 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 you can talk to me after or during the during the conference. And if you're interested in the ambassador program, uh, you can also talk to me. And we can discuss more about some of the plans I have as an individual uh, and that we can work uh, together with the PSF uh, to achieve uh, the languages and the community. I would love to end by saying the solution is within us in some sort of way. We just need to find a way of uh, voicing our solutions uh, in, in a more practical way, per se. Thank you. Uh, these are my emails if you want to talk about anything. Yeah, thanks very much. I would love to hand over to the organizers for any questions I may have. All right, thank you so much for uh, the great talk. We just loved it. And uh, uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the question and answer uh, chat. So I will try to write down the questions so that they appear on the screen and uh, uh, it will be easier for you also to, to read them out and uh, uh, to, uh, to answer them. So we got uh, one question, very interesting question. Uh, it's about the standard library. Uh, you mentioned that the standard library has been, uh, you know, sometimes seen as a problem. But uh, what is actually the problem with it? Is it uh, because it's too large, or or, or what else? Mm, okay, so the different discussions that have been had around the standard library has been that first of all, the the problem is they are old modules. But most importantly, most of the modules live in the standard library, but they're actually not maintained for some reason, for different reasons that I can't uh, pinpoint even myself. But it could be because of resor uh, resources. Some modules up to now don't even have an expert, like nobody knows, understands them at all. So it's too big, but also too big for people to maintain. If at some point it's grown uh, bigger than us, but also some things are obsolete, uh, they are old. Again, we are not the only people, Python is not the only language that has the same problem. I think even Ruby, uh, its standard library has grown to some point to be that it has old stuff, but also they found that having things in the, in the language itself, uh, it, it does not have maintainers and the learning curve to contribute to the core language itself is harder compared to if the library, for example, was on uh, PyPI. So I think it makes more sense if we had a more stream, streamlined uh, standard library and we have a path towards having more modules on PyPI that could uh, probably maybe we will have that have be, could have better maintenance there. So again, it's too big having obsolete stuff, but but it essentially also maintain poses a maintenance burden. So PyPI is better in that case. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great answer. Uh, great question and great answer. We have another very interesting question uh, in the chat. Um, what is the reason for switching from a ref counting to a tracing uh, garbage collector? 
uh, if it were performance, uh, what uh, would be the difference uh, that you would expect from uh, such a switch? switch? So, best of pre best of best of research, and again, I do research in garbage collection. And uh, if you have, if you, and I'm not burdening anybody to read or uh, to have an insight into existing research. Most people we move away from reference counting for performance reasons because uh, first issues like maintaining reference counts itself can be can pose an overhead, and. Uh, the fact that we need to have a hybrid sort of approach to solve all our problems regarding garbage collection, I think it's not very ideal uh, because we again need some sort of uh, tracing garbage collector to manage our cycles uh, per se. I have no prediction of how much difference we are going to have in Python that you can never make. I think predicting performance in such an early stage you can never make uh, right now. But what I think is that best of research there are things stressing garbage collection could give us a uh, sort of parallelism that uh, something that we can't do with re with reference counting uh, but we are confident that from insight we've had in other languages and existing research we are sure tracing garbage collection can give us be better benefits than reference counting okay uh joanna fantastic thank you so much for your uh for your answer a uh, you know very good question and uh fantastic answers um, just like before and uh, uh, we are running a little bit out of time and so i'm afraid we have to stop here but uh, i would like to thank you uh, for uh, taking the time to prepare this talk and delivering it we really enjoyed it thank you so much joanna <laughs>